This is season number 19 of Fast Talk Live with Matt Pankrak. BTL is presented by Lawrence, Fast Cat Boats, Aptco, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, X Zone Lures, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, and Pro Guide Batteries. Hit him with the hook, Jeffries. PTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about bass fishing. Wrapping up the week of regular shows here from the new studio in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Had a really good discussion yesterday with Matt Stefan. I never, I mean, I never saw myself in uh, 2023 living in Shawnee, Oklahoma, talking about gas stations on a podcast for 30 minutes. But hey, if you, if you travel the country and you want to know what the best gas station is, the best gas station food, the cleanest gas stations, the easiest in and out, Matt Stefan and I had about a half hour discussion on that yesterday, which I, which I thought was very helpful. Also, uh, if you missed that show, the year is kicking off now. And uh, we had a, a segment right there in the middle of the show that kind of organically happened that that I went back and listened to and took notes on. And it's it's things that you need in your boat and truck that you can get together now. Like if you're up in the north where things are, are frozen, uh, if you're in the south and your, your season's about to kick off, that will seem a little excessive now, but save your butt down the road. You know, zip ties, cables, different wrenches, fluids that you might need. Just just a, stuff that that Matt Stefan has been through over his 20 years of, of doing this and that I've experienced over my lack of preparation over the last 10 years that we now have and carry with us in the boat. So uh, our guest today, I feel like, is never unprepared. Like, I, I, this guy is, and I... I'm not exaggerating when I say that he is a, probably the most interesting man in the bass fishing industry. And it's not just the bass fishing industry. I'll go so far as to say the fishing industry. And I've known him for, I remember the first time I met him. We'll see if he remembers it. Let's, let's bring in from California. Turn your, uh, can you turn your speakers down there, Fred? Yep. All right. You still hear me? I can still hear you. All right. Do you remember the first time we met Fred? Fred Cantawi from California joins the show. BTL uh, today. Great to be here. Uh, yes, the first time we ever met, you were covering the PAA Corporate Cup. I believe that was the first time. And I was at the base of Wilson Dam. Was it Wilson or Wheeler? Wilson. Wilson. And I was fishing the tail race, which at the time, not a whole lot of people fished up there because it was like a river. It was like a jet boat type scenario. And I was fishing the base of the dam for, you know, all three days of that derby. And if I remember correctly, as a small mouth, you were on small mouth on a spinning rod. I was on small mouth and large mouth on a spinning rod in that, you know, ripping current. But there were times when I would go up and fish the dam where there were uh, there were shad going up and down the wall of the, the dam. And I was throwing a Neko rig in there with a spinning rod. And I had about a five-pound largemouth bite, set the hook, jumps clean in the water. You said it was about head high for me. Yeah. And as as a lot of people knew over the years, I always carried a salmon net in the boat because all I needed you to do was get the net around the fish and I'll put the fish in the net. And my co-angler at the time, uh, he, this thing jumps in the air and all he had to do was put it under it and it would have been another five pounder in the bag. But uh, sadly enough, that didn't happen. The fish came off. But You're you got right. a picture of that in midair. Yeah, I do. I remember that. So that would have been 2008, seven, eight, 2007, yeah, eight, one, one of the first tournaments that I, that I covered. I do remember that. Now you are, you're West Coast. Where are you at in California right now? Cause I know you've moved around a little bit. 
So mostly from, you know, San Francisco North, I lived at uh, Clear Lake or Lakeport, uh, which everybody knows that fishery. And then now I live up on the coast about four and a half hours north, right at the Oregon border. It's uh, seven miles to uh, Smith River and then 20 miles to Brookings, Oregon. So I'm right up on the ocean, right, right between Oregon and California, on the California side. Oh, so I've been in that neck of the woods because we flew into San Francisco when my cousin got married a long time ago and then rented a car and drove up to Grants Pass. Yep. Oregon. But I remember that coast. I mean, that's like cold water ocean, like kelp and and big rocky and wild with a lot of like little towns along like a really cool area. Yeah, it's the Redwoods and there's no place like it on Earth for sure. Lots of variety. Clay picked up on it on the instant feedback here. I did too. Two things that you said in one sentence, 2007, 2008, and and you were throwing, well, like we, I should have dealt with the first, let's go with the first one first. It's you call it a Neko, 90% of us call it a Nico, but is Neko the proper terminology? So I learned <laughs> the whole technique came from Japan and it was finesse fishing with a spinning rod and a very small worm and a light tungsten weight with a a wacky rig, you know, hook, you know, like a a steelhead style hook in it. And I learned it in a tournament at actually at Clear Lake where I was on these fish on a very rocky, bouldery, short stretch of bank that I could fish. This, the, the, the guy that I picked it up is a, a, famous Japanese fisherman and, and well-known in the U S and his name is Hideki Medea. And he is known for the, uh, walking bait that, uh, originally came out the, uh, gosh darn, what's the name of the bait? Not the Sammy. No, like the Sammy, like the the Sam, the three hook version, the, uh, not the Reaper, not the Jackal. No, Anyways, we'll, we'll figure that out. Anyways, he's made some of the, some great baits over the years and, uh, we were fishing and he was absolutely, the wind was howling. And, and so I had to have the bow pointed out and we were fishing the shoreline. So I had to cast behind me in order to fish. Mm -hmm. And so he was on the back deck of the boat. So he had the, the prime cast. But we're catching these fish, but he is absolutely doing nothing. He's throwing this little tiny worm out, and he is just jacking these big ones one after the other. And he's like, I'm going to win this tournament. And So he got me set up with it, and I had very light line as well. Uh, I was fishing with five-pound test, and I ended up hooking like three 10-pound class fish every single day. Oh, my gosh. Landed the biggest fish of the tournament, 11-pound, one ounce on five-pound test. Uh, it was amazing. I what had, year was this? Like uh, roundabout? That would have been so probably 2005 or six, somewhere right in there. So who's using the Neko rig? I mean, there's a just like him and a handful of people he he'd showed and maybe a couple others. Like, I mean, you're not dealing with thousands of people that even knew what the heck this was at that point. No, I never heard of a single person and, and just a few, you know, just during that same time period, the drop, the drop shot came along. Yep. So this was right in about that same time frame, And it was absolutely amazing to watch this guy work off the back deck and then actually teach me during the tournament, you know, the <laughs> sin is never fish something you've never fished before. But over the course of three days, it was just, it was like a game changer. And I loved finesse fishing anyways. And you think of Clear Lake as being a power lake, but there are as many big fish caught there on finesse stuff as on, you know, the big baits, the 10 and 12 inch glide baits, like behind you up there. But But uh, he called it a Neko. That's a, that's the, uh, uh, bull shad glide. And then the, like the four by four bluegill. And then the Power Ranger or whatever that is, Buzz Lightyear or something. No, that's the Oklahoma Sooners uh, oh. hockey, 12-inch hockey figure. Oh, nice. If you it's... hit the head, the stick makes a slap shot motion. 
perfect. Yeah, yeah it's just like, a little eclectic. But anyway, he called it a Neko, not an Eco. So you're going with Neko since. Yeah, we kind of like the candy, but uh, who knows? But and and at the time, he didn't speak very good English, mm -hmm. and he took like 20 minutes for every fish that he landed. He had two scales, and it was amazing. But he did win as the co-angler that year, and part of that, you know, the three days of that tournament was the first day was on my boat. But uh, I learned a lot. And I learned that I knew nothing about finesse fishing like these guys. They were unbelievable. But, uh, yeah, so that, that was pretty cool. Vixen. Was it the Vixen that he created? The Vixen. The Vixen. There you go. It was on the tip of my tongue. I got a Vixen up there. Yeah, and the Vixen and the Bone Collar, uh, I don't know what that fetches on the Internet these days. but uh, Yeah, I think uh... – I think they just came out with version number three of the Vixen. So if I have this, I'm a little bit of a Vixen freak. So if they write, they had the OGs and that was the one that like a lot of couldn't, they wouldn't go in. That was like the original or the Andre one when they came out with that Andre Moore. Right. Correct. And that's the one that had the naked chick in the background and the packaging. And then they had the barely legal Vixen, which was like the three and a half, four inch version. And then the Vixen. Yeah. And then, it got real popular on the FLW tour and elite series, but was kind of kept under wraps. Cause you have to remember no social media or anything back then. Correct. So like you, and if you were live, it wasn't, or not, there was no live and the recording was only on the final day. So they would just say, ah, oh, just throwing a spook. Got it. Yeah. Does that, no, does that sound right to you? Yes. And at the time we had a lot of them. I, I mean, we'd lose them to fish, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But but yeah, that that's a that's a definitely one of those Hall of Fame baits for sure. And but then so, it, went, it went away. Uh, uh, this is an interesting timeline. You would know this. So then it went away, and then I believe that was when Bub Tosh and Paycheck got a hold of it in some fashion, and then it came out with the Repo Man. Yes. And then that went away, and then series number two of the Vixen came out from Reaction Innovations. And then that went away. And then the Tekel Kick Knocker came out, which was the say a very similar version of that. And I think that's still available. And now version number three of the Vixen's out. And so who brought out version number three? Did Andre come out with that? Or no, is that uh I know that I think Josh Heron's running the show over there. Matt Matt Heron's kid over at Reaction okay. Innovations. Okay, yep. Yeah. So the that whole bait came from Hideki Medea. And okay. so he's, he is still the one. I'm not sure if he's making it for Andre again or not, but the Tekle version of that was the, the last version that I have. Kick knocker. Yeah. I, I think I, still, I have, I have those that uh, he gave me one year at ICAST or the classic or something, but yeah. So neat bait. I did. Uh, two full days of video work with Brian Snowden on Table Rock Lake a couple years ago. And, you know, as he was going to pay me a rate for the day or anything, and I'm in his garage, immaculate. I mean, not a, I'm, I'm serious, Fred. I think the guy goes in and makes sure there's not like spots of oil or water spots on the cement in his garage. I mean, immaculate. So he's got all the pegs hanging up and he's got one peg. Like an airplane in it. Hanger. Yeah, it looks exactly like an airplane hanger. Anyway. He's got a, a lime ice, barely legal first generation Vixen on the wall. That's pretty special. Uh, I, I drove home with zero cash in the wallet and one lime ice, barely legal Vixen for two days of work. That's who you are. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. Yeah, no doubt. And it's a, I've got it in the living room now. Yeah. Good stuff. So, yeah, all right. Some of those original baits that I gave you, maybe some some glide baits no so the original bait that you gave me that i still have and i carry it with me to this day it's still in it's in the uh i put it in the wake bait slash odd top water box right mm -hmm. it's the shimano can i talk can i say it i mean are you over that phase because for a while i was under like a what is that not an embargo not no not an embargo what is it when you're not allowed to talk about it yeah like a gag, gag yeah order. i was on a gag order from you for the yeah, shimano absolutely. triple impact that's correct 
Explain that one, because I, I would venture to say a lot of the listeners and viewers don't know what a Shimano Triple Impact is. So the Shimano Triple Impact, I believe you can still get that. And then I think there is made, uh, there is one made by another company as well now. But basically, it's a wake bait with a prop in the back. And it's shaped like a jerk bait that got stepped on by a Caterpillar tractor. So it's got some bumps and bends, but the the tail actually kicks up on it and it's got a little prop in the back and that thing calls in the big ones. And I remember when I first got them on one of my trips over to Japan, I was like, ah, I don't know about this thing, but I brought it home and I had a really good partner as a fisherman at the time. And he's like, Oh, that thing's stupid, blah, blah, blah. And, and so I threw it out there and man, it was just like, it was like crack cocaine to spotted bass. And then I've used it over the years and collect them and, and whatnot. But yes, I, I remember giving you one of those and, and I'm sure you've caught some fish on it over the years. Yeah. I, I think I can, uh, I think I can show people what I was talking about here. It's a really, uh, crazy looking bait. There it is right there. That's it. It's got a little little tungsten ball or metal ball in the lip there. And if you try to reel it too fast, it blows out. It blows out. But it's not a fun fish, fun bait to fish. No, the magic of that bait is being patient and slow reeling and then watching the absolute best explosion of your life when one eats it. And if you put the uh, the owner uh, 41 BC, I believe, mm -hmm. hook on that thing, it grabs them and they don't get off of it. It's like it's a chore to get it get a fish off with it, but it catches monsters. You've been a, you've been a big fan of those owners for a long time. I remember that like all of your baits have those on there. Well, certain baits, but I like you know obviously both both Gamakatsu and Owner are you know go tos and one at one time one another. But that yeah that forty one is a that's a mean hook on the right bait, but it's a heavy hook. So it's not something you would throw on every bait, your bait, you know, a lot of your crank baits and stuff would sink with it on there. So. God, that's good. Ta that's good tackle. Like that. I bet those baits haven't been talked about in a hot minute. Any of that stuff we just mentioned. Yeah. Those are, those are two winners there. All right. Let's, let's briefly touch on what what's going on out you got your is all those, are those all emails that are coming through for you uh, yeah those are all emails Go yeah can can you close the email thing I, so we're not or is that going to close your screen too or mute the sound i don't even know if that's coming through on that but i figured that was what it was because you're yeah unfortunately. business day that's just opening anyway uh let's start start briefly right now just to get a, a, a grasp for our listeners and viewers on what you do now and then i want to go back and walk through because i don't know this fred i don't think anyone there we have discussions in the fishing industry about who you are uh oh like you're a, you're a bad. you're a man of mystery in the in the industry but now uh, and then you're what are you 10 years in yet on douglas yeah just about 10 years that's correct and you explain what you do for douglas because people have, have seen you you're at all the trade shows now the classic you're big into rod design yeah, I always have been big into product design in, in the outdoor industry, mostly in fishing, uh, from fly rods to waders to, you know, clothing and, and, and rods, you know, both fly and conventional and now ocean again. But yeah, so all of that, now that's Douglas Outdoors and, and that's a whole nother story. That, that's your main jam right now is Douglas. Yes, and, and really making the best equipment. Uh, as you know, I'm a tackle junkie and a perfectionist when it comes to equipment, line hooks, snap swivels, everything, reels, drags, you know, knots, you name it. Everything has got to be absolutely perfect. Unfortunately, I don't get a, sleep, a lot of sleep because of that. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm always messing with stuff, tackle crafting, but, uh, yeah, so I design rods and I always feel like, uh, the best parts of, you know, working for Douglas is that I have 
pretty much free reign when it comes to making, you know, the best equipment for people that make a living catching fish, whether they be guides for salmon or the bass guys. I just talked to Martin Villa this morning and about 80% of the conversation was about nuances on rods and the differences those make and what a big tool they are in the on the angler's deck. I mean, especially the tournament bass angler, you have eight hours to get the job done if you're lucky, because a lot of that can be done driving, especially on the bigger lakes around the U.S. If your stuff's in Ticonderoga and you left Plattsburgh, uh, you might be dealing with two hours of fishing if you're lucky at the end of the day and have gone through four tanks of gas to get there and back. So uh, everything's got to be right. And I think that the rod is absolutely one of the most important things. And I focus on making a lot of different models because there's just a little bit of difference between every model that works perfectly for a particular bait or fish or bite uh, given on that day. So, and you do weird links too. You do like seven, 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 not like I remember just when you're going through it back when you came and visited that one time, you had all sorts of odd links for the rods. Sure. And I think that, you know, as the, the simple part of bass fishing, and that's the hard thing about getting some of this across to the anglers, there are lengths and weights of rods and actions that make super sense for particular baits. Glide baits, for instance, they're just a whole nother creature and you need a totally different piece of equipment, not a flip and stick, not a salmon back bouncing rod. You need a rod that's, you know, made for a glide bait that you can feel and get the bite and actually get the hook in the fish. And that's part of the design element. And so like, that's one of my ones that I just pour years over into every model to, to get it just right for, for those baits. All right. Here's what I want to do, Fred. <clears throat> I want to go through that must've been a big email. I want to go through, <laughs> Sorry, it's fine. I want to go through the list of things that you have done in the fishing and outdoor industry, not talk about them yet. And then since this is only one show as we could do a show on each one of these things, I will go back and then we'll pick, we'll pick some of the most intriguing, intriguing things. Does that sound, does that sound sure. fair? Sure. All right. So, so, Where do you start? Well, okay. So we've got rod designer down and I'll make this list. So then we also have to have professional angler down, right? Sure. We will re we will revisit that. Uh, you have Alaska salmon and trout guide, right? Sure. You have, uh, science. Si what, how would you could call when you were catching fish for science? So basically it just worked with uh, different fisheries and figuring out sometimes it was a water quality issue. Sometimes it was species identification in particular bodies of water, uh, populations, et cetera, and how they were affected by dam releases or effluent, et cetera. So yeah, doing sci scientific research. Okay. Uh, that's separate from the years that you spent in the desert, GPS coordinating rare and endangered flowers, right? that's different okay so you're but in the same in in the same light of of looking at uh, different plants that can take over any particular crop a natural crop or a natural forage for you know ducks or geese or whatever lives in that area so that's another thing but yeah some invasive species as far as plants go or can be wicked on a the the whole overall ecosystem okay uh product designer wide array of products that are available on the market today some of which yeah you already have to talk about it but there's a lot of stuff that's out there you've designed products for a lot of different companies over the years that are, are currently in use in both the fresh saltwater trout salmon bass the whole nine yards correct all right what what else am i missing here oh i don't know i got a got a degree in agriculture wine and grapes so uh wine is sort of a, a big thing not 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 a drunk or anything but i do enjoy a sal salmon salmonier uh salmonier no uh not so much but more the uh growing of of grapes and wine and 
and then of course anology. But. Wait, so you've grown a, a oh, this is bad that you've grown a wine vineyard before? So uh, before I went on tour, I was working for Kendall Jackson, one of the bigger wineries in the world, and uh, for Jess Jackson, and I was in a division called Winery Practices. So I fish and you know do all my thing and then i would actually i actually had a job doing that uh where i would be a liaison between the grower and the winemaker and the grower says i grow the best grapes and the winemakers say i i make the best wine this is what i need from the wine the the grape grower etc and so i was a go between to you know some years the winemaker would say drop all of that fruit i don't want any of it and they would pay for the acreage and the the you know, the grape grower would be like, I'm still getting paid, but I can't, like, I don't want to throw my grapes on the ground or they thin them out to where there's just tiny clusters, etc. Those are building for high end wines. But uh, yeah, that was fun. That was really, and I got to know a lot of like awesome fishermen and hunters from, you know, being in the wine business as well. All right. That's, that's outdoorsy. We'll count that as an outdoors. What else am I missing here? Before yeah. we go back and we and we and we pick pick apart some of these occupations. Oh, I don't know. I did. I also did work uh, in travel as well, and I took people all over the planet. You know, fishing, whether it be Africa or Russia or Alaska or South America, etc. Um, Norway, Sweden, just all lots of different countries, over fifty countries, just. Traveling, You've guided in over 50 countries? Catching, fishing. I either guided or took groups to different, you know, different locations, different lodges around the world, whether they were for billfish or tigerfish or you name it. So that was that was sort of uh, uh, part of it, all part of it. You know, it just kind of interloops and intertwines and you do one thing for a while and meanwhile doing 20 other things but yes i spent my earliest years uh pretty much horseback fishing hunting all that so it all just kind of bloomed into a life where maybe i'm not the richest guy in the world but i certainly have had uh, a lot of great experiences been in places where i shouldn't have been uh for sure uh, been under under machine gun uh, care for in West Africa, fishing for tarpon. I've been right on the border of the DMZ and fishing up there between South and North Korea. I've spent time in the Amazon where there were giant snakes and piranhas. And I actually have a, I have a scar on this finger that looks like a crescent from yeah. being bitten by a piranha about 5,000 times where uh, we're using the piranhas for bait. And uh, that's, that's a whole nother story, but I was bloodied and laughing the whole time. Uh, all right. This just threw a wrench in it where you have to go back to the phrase under machine gun care. So in a lot of the places that you fish that are not inside the U S there's a lot of, trouble within the country and mm -hmm. to go there you are literally putting yourself at risk to go catch a fish or hunt or whatever it is and so i've been to places like in sierra leone where we literally had a guy with a machine gun in the boat you know just for safety and you were fishing for what species so uh giant tarpon how do you end up in these like situations how did what do you just meet people at the right time at the right place and it works yeah, or? so like we would have different destinations that we worked with and then different destinations that would pop up that where they would want you to come uh and then test out the fisheries and see if it was a viable marketable fishery so i did a lot of that i went to norway in some years where the tourist council would bring me over and then I'd spend a month just bouncing around a place like Norway and go and sting in these like giant like manners that the English guys had. And, and I would just be the only person there. 
I remember one time I went to in Norway, I, I went to this place and the, the guy in broken English said, you know, do you want to go fishing later? And I had been traveling who knows where, you know, I was tired and I said, yeah. sure. So out of my room, I was looking at this guy preparing this net up, you know, out at this lake to go fish for these Browns. And, and so I came out and I said, no, 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 I, I'm, I, I'll pass on that, you know, going netting for brown <laughs> trout because, you know, they're looking for them for food. Yeah. But to him, we were going fishing and I'm like, well, this isn't really what I was here for. But I was bouncing around this giant manor, like, you know, a 50 room manor with, you know, these carvings of Atlantic salmon on the wall. And just like you could just feel the history in these places. And uh, yeah, amazing stuff. So you are going to test the viability of a fit, like, can someone yeah, like, come here, put a lodge, bring tourists in and make money like they have down in Mexico or like you have a fly in trip or you have the Amazon over there? Like you were a guy who went around to see if this was a place that could work. Correct. How long yeah. did you do that for? Uh, I did that. I did that in the in the 90s. Yeah, in the 90s for quite a few years. I worked for a place called Rod and Reel Adventures and, you know, still worked with all of my product design and still guided. You know, it wasn't like I did just one thing at any given time. I always yeah. had, you know, six balls in the air because you're trying to make enough money so you can go on this next junket somewhere. And I got addicted to that early, early on when I was in Alaska. I always had super wealthy clients and they'd be like, Hey, we want to go to so-and-so. And I'd be like, okay, let's, let's look at that and see if we can go there. So, yeah. So it brought me to a lot of, you know, unusual places that uh, sometimes were good and sometimes were complete bust, you know, like it wasn't viable, you know, it was, was either. North Korea bust. North Korea was a place where you don't really, you can't go there. Uh, and as an American. Oh, yeah, sure. aware of that. But I mean, you're Fred Katawi. I figured you were in there catching like 30 inch rainbows on mouse patterns. <laughs> yeah, well, I've, sn I've snuck around in some places that were, you know, probably off limits. But, but yeah, you did I, fish like right around that, that North South I, Korea. Yeah, area? I fished right. Yeah, right in that area. For what's there? So there's all kinds of cool fish there. There's, uh, there's a fish that is like a bonefish that's in the rivers and they're not super easy to catch. And I've caught little, all sorts of little, little tiny fish that are really, you know, unidentified, but like beautiful colors and, and just, you know, they might only be four inches long. And a lot of times we're trying to tackle those with a fly rod, but I, uh, I caught a fish in South Korea. Oh, probably, seven or eight years ago and they said oh, we haven't seen one of these except for in an aquarium for you know like in the wild for like 40 years so i've got a picture of this thing in the palm of my hand and it's you know it's three quarters the length of the palm of my hand but it's the coolest looking fish ever it's kind of like some of those little amazon fish that mm -hmm. you just don't see but uh, and there's all kinds of trout species and and smaller salmon you know cherry salmon etc in in asia so yeah there's actually six species of Pacific salmon. So anyway, right. we'll take a, we'll take a break and then we'll see if, if we'll see if you can find the mute button on your uh, email, got because it. we've got everyone checking their email every time it goes off. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. We'll go to break. It, it's all good though. But when we come back, we're, we're going to go up to Alaska because that is where I, I realized that, you're not BSing. Like, I mean, I'd heard a couple stories before and I was like, that fantastic storyteller. I'm sure you better, but you don't really know. And I go up to Alaska <laughs> and I had a moment. I had a, oh my gosh, it's all, it's all true. It's all real stuff moment. And there's hard proof of it. Yeah. Little Remember that? And riffles and yeah. 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 So, so we'll talk about that when we come back with, uh, with Fred Katawi on Wednesday. January 11th, 1 1 1 2023. It's BTL. We'll be back right after this. Introducing HDS Pro. Watch fish reacting to your lure live. 
with Active Target 2. Get game changing clarity in the megahertz range with the new Active Imaging HD sonar. Find the richest fishing spots with CMAPS charts. Take full control of your boat with the ultimate fishing system. HDS Pro. The more you see, the more you catch. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Hey guys, Gerald Swindle representing the AFCO Hydronaut. This is the jacket I love wearing when times is tough. And I'm talking about the weather, not the fishing. The jacket, what I like, I got a double cup right here. I can seal up the bottom of my jacket because when you're fishing, you're holding your arms up. You're bad about getting water runs downhill. Everything bends good. I'm long arm. Look, it fits very comfortable. My arms are flexible. I've got the speed hood on, pouring down rain. I can get everything zipped up. One thing they did is they made plenty of pocket space. If you ain't got enough pockets in a Hydronaut rain suit, you just got too much stuff from the water man brain that's 30k baby 30 times the reason you ain't gonna get wet super warm if it's cold in the winter time you put on your hydronaut you're gonna be a much more comfortable person if you want to just look sexy at dairy queen wear your hydronaut we got it from small to 5x most rain gear does not come in that many sizes you got waist adjusting straps we can make it fit you no matter what the environment is we want you to be comfortable we want you to be dry you gotta check it out it ain't gonna let you down are you looking to install your own fishing electronics the solution is the Bass Tank Power Harness. It takes the guesswork out of installation. No more voltage issues or interference. Designed by an engineer so that you can get professional results right there in your own garage. Installation done right with the help of the Bass Tank Power Harness. You can feel confident knowing that your installation was done right. The Bass Tank Power Harness. Give us a call or order yours today at thebasstank.com. Get the best patterns backed by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. Know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the Deep Dive app today. Look at that beast right there. All right, we are back. On a Wednesday, BTL from Shawnee, Oklahoma. Did you add suspenders? I'm taking them off. Okay. I have no acetal. No, I saw you had to let the let the dog out. Yeah, no, he's he's around. Come here. So, uh, my but yeah, if you got a dog, we show dogs on BTL. That's yeah. kind of like a thing. Yeah, of course. Come on, Ben Ben. Come with the daddy. Come on. Oh, it's right there. I thought that was a pillow. Oh, I that's, didn't even it, see it. That's Kissy Face Boy. What's his name? That's Benny. And what is what is Benny? Benny is ten breeds. He's a good boy. And Benny's one of the top three most well-behaved dogs that we've had on BTL. Yeah, he's a good boy. All right, so my one of my best friends uh, lives in Alaska. Met him when I played hockey for OU. Yes, you did. And I had known that through our friendship, you had mentioned, hey, I've been up to Alaska before. Did a little guiding up there, but I didn't really ask much. So he calls me. How long ago is this now? Six, seven years ago? And he's like, hey, we're going to go up to the the uh knack neck river in king sam in alaska his family owns a uh guide service alaska west air lives on the lake they do the haviland beavers otters helicopters right? right so it's a it's a it's a float plane that you have to stop at lake clark Correct. to get fuel where i used to live port allsworth I'm, I I got to pull the map up on this because this is just absolutely bonkers, Fred. And then you fuel up there, and it, it's the only civilization in how many miles? 
It's uh, 220 Air West miles through like a rugged Alaska range uh, going into Lake Clark. And then you leave Lake Clark and that flows down to uh, Lake Iliamna, which is the largest lake in Alaska. And that uh, creates the Quijack River that flows down into the Bristol Bay, which the Naknek River also joins in the Alagnak River uh, to go into the Bristol Bay. So Southwest Alaska. All right. I'm, uh, I'm getting this pulled up. F- fact of the matter is though, it's at the, it's at the base of the Aleutian Island chains. So it is the, what would form, what would be the body of the tail, if you will, of the Aleutian Islands. So yes, it's all the, the, the land mass that's Northwest of the Aleutian chain or North of the Aleutian chain, if you will, because that actually goes much further West, but at the top end of it, that creates, you know, that great, you know, Alaska peninsula. Right. Where so... Lake, Lake Iliamna and Naknek and all that is. This shows that you have no re. Okay, here's the uh, yeah, deal. My national park. Yeah. Okay, so this is is this the Kenai Peninsula right here? That is, yep. That is the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. So you have what, like Homer down here, Kenai, all sorts, Salvatna. Yep. Uh, where's where's uh, so Anchorage. Anchorage? Anchorage is somewhere back in. Oh, no, up in Anchorage here. is just north of that, which right is here. This this now south of that. So the little point that you look, it looks like it's got a face. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, but that's the Turnagain arm. That's the cook inlet. So this is popular. This is where people fish the Kenai river, where you hear of the King salmon runs and the wild rainbows and all this. So where we went, you take a float plane Yeah. and you go over, this is all massive. Like we're talking like whales and there's nothing like glaciers that you fly over and things. There's nothing. So that this is Lake Clark. That's Lake Clark. There's zero. This is the aerial footage. There's zero people. There's zero human inhabitants at all. Like this doesn't, there's nothing that, out here. Right where your, right where your cursor is, that is uh, the little town of Port Allsworth. And I worked at a lodge that's just west of that airstrip or north of the airstrip. And the governor of Alaska worked, oh, just up this way at the top of it. Okay. And, uh, his name was Jay Hammond, and and he's, there's incredible uh, PBS footage and books that he's written, etc. Anyways, that's Lake Clark. And then so that goes, this is where you get gas, and then you get back in the float plane, and yeah, you go and Lake Iliamna, and that that this is, is where uh, Jeremy Wade did the River Monsters on the Sturgeon, just for a, reference. That's a thousand square mile lake. That's a thousand square miles. Yeah. So then that river that forms and comes out of that, that's a famous sockeye salmon and rainbow fishery. And that's the Quijack River. And then the river that you see coming in down there at the point, uh, a little further north again, that's the Alagnac River. Okay. Where's the Naknek then? And the Naknek, keep going down the bay, keep going south. There, there you go. Okay. That's so this is, this is the yep, Naknek River, folks. Went. That's this correct. is a Alaska. We just talked about how we're getting here. So you get into the Naknek River. Yeah, and you go to King Salmon. And you go to King Salmon, Alaska. Population 18. We traded two bottles of Jack for a boat for two boats for the week from a native who had seven cats. And he also was the general manager of the store and also a bar back. Wow. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yeah. You like like me. You gotta have a lot <laughs> of different jobs to, you know. So anyway, I tell Fred I'm going up to Alaska and I'm going to the Naknek River. There's Fred Kentawi, who I know is a professional bass fisherman. And you tell me what riffle I need to drift my bead down for a 30-inch rainbow trout on the Naknek River. That's the place, yeah. Further up, a little further up river, but yes. It, it, it was, I mean, this is this place is does not exist on earth this is literally the needle in the haystack maybe a hundred people go here every year well more than that now and more than that then but yes that's a that is a sparsely populated place in the world 
Correct. Most and famous you, for, for sockeye salmon. And actually. you guided there. I did. Yeah. So, which leads me to me going, hey, Owen, I got a buddy who's actually guided there. And he says, you drop me pins. He said, this is where we need to fish for rainbow trout. And he's like, I'm calling BS on this. And I said, no, he said he wrote a book about it or something. And he's like, huh? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. But you sent me a copy of the book. I did. But it what? wasn't a, it wasn't a book about that, but it was a book about the technique we're steelhead. using there. Yeah. Steelhead fishing. What was it called? Side Drifting for Steelhead by Amato. Myself and J.D. Ritchie uh, co-authored it. So I said, hey, my buddy Fred, who I fish with, and no, wrote a book. I said, and here's the book. And Owen goes, wait, you know this guy? And I said, yeah, and I'm with a dude who, uh, who owns a fly shop called Pretty Fly for a White Guy. And <laughs> I mean, like, we're talking like purist guys, right? Yeah, and they sure. both Owen goes into his room and he comes out with a weathered paperback copy of Side Drifting for Steelhead by J.D. Ritchie and Fred Cantawi, and he goes, "Dude, this is the Bible up here for us." Huh? And wow. I'm like, Pretty "Really?" Cool. And he's like, "Yeah, we've read it like eight or nine times." And there it is, right there, Side Drifting for Steelhead with J.D. Ritchie and Fred Cantawi. Yeah, that's it. I that's Big freaking door. crazy stuff. Carp in a clown suit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've you how long did you do the Alaska? I mean, obviously long enough to write a book about it. Well, so the book isn't particularly focused on Alaska, but the techniques are, you know, West Coast and for sure. And then Great Lakes as well, where Douglas is. But it's 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 something where I was in high school. Had a drift boat, started guiding the Eel River in Northern California, and I happened to guide a couple of people that owned a lodge in Alaska, and they said, do you want to go? So 17 years old, I fly to Alaska, and I go to work, and my first place I ever landed other than Anchorage was King Salmon, Alaska, and I guided that summer on the uh, Alagnac River for kings and trout and whatnot, and that was years of doing that. Uh, in between all of the other things that I've done. But uh, yeah, that was a big part of my life for a lot of years, uh, guiding in and around Alaska. And and it just, there's no place like it. It's unbelievable. You know, big fish. And, you know, it's, they're easy to catch compared to all of the things that we do. And, and, and my hat's off to all these guys that chase uh, large mouth and small mouth and spots, you know, to make a living with because they're incredibly hard to catch compared to many of the places you go to catch fish in the world because they're so pressured. But, uh, and you only have eight hours to get it done each day. So fun stuff as far as that goes. But man, the pros that are out there making a living, I can't tell you how good they are. Amazing. You think you'll ever go back to Alaska or going bass fishing to Alaska? Oh yeah. I'll, I'll, of course I'll go back to Alaska. That's a, it's a special place. It just, I haven't been in a few years and it's about time I go back. Uh, I'm not sure where I go or what I do, but I've done some, some off the cuff stuff there too, way up North, like fishing for she fish. Uh, that's a, that's sort of a, a fish that no one really is not not a whole lot of people have, have caught and it it doesn't exist further south you have to go up to the Kuskokwim and and further north from there in the Yukon to find those fish but that's a that's a unique fish as well it's like a snook the that's sheep wild. Fish. yeah so yeah i oh, make yeah. a fish for something something a little little less easy to catch a little more remote. So I got to know you when you were fully out wrapped Jersey on the FLW tour, Orange County choppers. It was when OCC was massive on the air. Uh, it was, I think it was on the discovery channel, Polly and all them. I mean, and, and you were a, the Orange County choppers pro ranger, right? You had your ranger wrapped orange 
flames the whole nine yards orange county choppers yeah that that uh that was that was a pretty cool period of of my life for sure uh geez definitely a highlight it wasn't i can say honestly it wasn't the easiest fishing i came from the west and i think i'm going to go back there and light them up you know we talk about these drought years and what happens as far as an angler not as far as weather but you'll you'll not cash a check or you'll cash a check in every single tournament, whatever. So I was used to being at home where I was more comfortable. I knew the waters, I knew the techniques, uh, everything that really made sense. And then I went back East and I felt like I was in, you know, Nova Scotia. I just had no idea. Like I would go into coves and I would be like, I wonder if there's even a fish in this cove, you know, like where we're going, you know, this year for the Bassmaster Classic and, um, you know, Teleco and, and Fort Loudon. And I was just overwhelmed, but I was fortunate enough to have a association with the Discovery Channel and the American Chopper Show. And we, uh, we put one of my boats together for, to fish on tour. And that was uh, really the first of the boats that we had put together that had the, Orange County chopper trap. And so we had uh, the guys from Ranger Boats, Randy Hopper and Greg Hopper and, you know, Forrest was involved and Don Lee at the time, uh, Jim Murphy, which at the time was uh, um, with a company called Albright, but he was with Hardy. And, and so we, we actually built this boat and Paul Tuttle came and fished a couple of tournaments as a co-angler and, and I fished uh, out of those boats for, uh, I believe, four seasons uh, back east fishing on tour. And it was, like I said, it was challenging. We were trying to do television shows and take footage. And I was doing another show at the time as well, uh, How to Make a Million Dollars Bass Fishing. And uh, my cousin produced that. And that, that was kind of fun, but it, it didn't leave a whole lot of time for practice. And I learned, like, having a camera in your face 24-7 wasn't really that cool uh i'm not you know just i am who i am but man that was frustrating but i did get to meet it opened up a doors to meet like all kinds of incredible people and i had great acceptance from the anglers on tour and i think particularly because they couldn't figure out how i had all these giant sponsors and it was partially just because of being i think a decent person and having really good connections in things outside of fishing. So I had super great sponsors. So I had, didn't have to make a paycheck as far as fishing went, but I certainly had to produce somehow. And, and it took about four years to really catch fish back there. Like where I was comfortable fishing my old techniques, going back to swim baiting and I would have my moments, but overall, you know, going to Okeechobee and the Potomac and all of these fisheries, you know, like I, you and I had fished a tournament on Grand Lake in Oklahoma. And, uh, I think we went about four counties away from Eufaula on Eufaula where, where we were literally, I don't know, to get there by boat would have been incredible, but you know, it taken a day to get there, but I, I learned the, the area that we fished from Terry Butcher uh, who used to be on tour as well and, and, uh, uh, unbelievable angler, but, uh, the Oklahoma guys, you know why they do so well. They just, they go through a lot to catch fish in, the, in mostly windblown muddy waters of Oklahoma. I found this article. This might be the greatest article ever written. Just as far as names, it is this insane. October 26, 2007. There's no pictures for it. Zaldane leads Walmart FLW series event on Clear Lake. 2007. Okay. San Jose, California's Chris Zaldane caught a five bass limit weighing 21 pounds, five ounces to lead the $1 million Walmart FLW National Guard division. He holds a seven pound, 10 ounce lead over Andre Moore. Oh, wow. Talks yeah. about how Zaldane caught his fish. Rounding out the top five pros, 
includes uh <laughs> dude i'm gonna have to have him on to talk about this Team Emodium Pro, Brett Height of Phoenix, Arizona. Brett oh, Height ran an Emodium right. AD rap for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was were all you part aware of that MLW package. Yep. Were, were you aware? You know that he had to be super pumped that he's on a team deal. Everything's rolling. They break out the team deals and they're like, you get Pringles and you get Snickers and you get, get Walmart. Folgers and you get Emodium. And you get Emodium AD. Yeah. I'm going to have to call him and ask him about that. Yeah, I think there was a Prilosec boat. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Uh, so here's some other names. This is from one article, Fred, in 2007. So we're 16 years ago. Okay. Tim Klinger, rounding out the top 10. Jay Yellis, rounding out the top 10. Then there's this sentence. Fred Kentawi of Lakeport, California. Earned the day's $488 Snickers Big Bass Award in the Pro Division thanks to an 11-pound, one-ounce bass that he caught in a Zoom swamp crawler. Kentawi's monster bass had to be finessed to the boat as he was using five-pound test fluorocarbon line and spinning gear, making the catch even more impressive. Yeah, that was a that was a great and frustrating tournament. So that goes back to Hideki Medea and the vixen and learning how to fish that neko rig and uh uh i literally other than tim Klinger, could have blown the doors off that tournament had i been able to land those giant bass every day like three for sure 10 pound class fish that i'd hook in these big boulders in this you know deep wall and um it was, yeah, incredible fishing. But yeah, that was a that was a cool, memorable tournament for sure. But, but wait, there's more. Uh oh. Team National Guard co angler Justin Lucas of Folsom, California, <laughs> claimed his second consecutive FLW victory when he won the co angler division in twenty five thousand dollars on Friday. Yeah, pretty amazing. Lucas becomes the first co-angler to post back-to-back -back wins in FLW series competition. I've been so lucky to get such great pros for the six days these last two events, Lucas said. To come and fish with the best pros in the West and win money while doing it, how can you beat that? Yeah, that is a pretty good article. You know, there's a lot of... Uh... There's a lot of those guys from the West that, you know, they came out and they fished uh, as a co-angler for a bunch of years. You know, the Cody Myers, the just uh, Sal Dane. I mean, there's just Ish Monroe, Brent Ayler, Brent Height, you know, just, you know, the list goes on and on. Yeah. But, and Tim Klinger. I mean, Tim's won the U.S. Open. I mean, there's just, you know, so Clear Lake is a... a uh, meeting of the minds, if you will, out west. It's kind of like the Okeechobee of Florida. It's like there's no place like it. And Hideki Medea. <laughs> Medea, he finished third. He had 15 bass, 49 11. Yeah, I thought he ended up winning that. Uh, sorry, Justin, for saying that, but I thought he uh, wanted He definitely was in the lead that first day because he had like 21 or 22 pounds, you know, out of the back of the boat, which was the front of the boat because I had it, you know, angled towards uh, the opposite way I wanted to fish, but I had to do that because it was so windy and rough. It was like an yeah. October tournament, I believe. When you ran the uh, OCC boat for four years, did you just have – crazy people stopping you along the way like i would imagine it would have to be difficult to go anywhere with that thing back then yeah so the other thing that we had was uh at the time we had a motor home that was decked out with occ plus the the boat wrap and and unfortunately but fortunately covering the boat covered all of the all of the press which was your sponsors and everything so i would be driving across the country with this uncovered ranger you know covered in mud or snow or whatever but it it came at at great rewards because i'd stop at those great gas stations that you talk about and i would just need to get fuel and move on but then i'd talk to you know 50 people while i was there and they'd take pictures and whatnot so it was yeah it was pretty cool and you didn't really go anywhere where where people didn't you know, just totally climb on and want to hear about, you know, 
the fighting between junior and senior, you know, just all the bike builds, all of the cool stuff, which was amazing. But we went to Austin, Texas one year and it was uh, a tour event and it was at Lake Travis. So when we went there, it was like they rolled out the red carpet. It was like we were celebrities. We were just, you know, Ken Wick, myself, Brent Height, uh, um, uh, geez, just the guys that were fishing on the tour at the time, we'd go into town and it was just, it was like a big party for sure. It was a lot of fun. Everyone was asking you about Orange County choppers and just wanted some emodium from B height. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Tim and B height. That's for sure. Do and you miss, now. you miss fishing at that level? Like, is there a part of you that's like, man, I, I, I wish I could go take another crack at it now. Yeah. So, uh, my wife, Julie, asks me all the time. She's like, well, what do you want to do? Where, you know, do you want to, like, I'm, I live in heaven, you know, where I'm surrounded by fishing and, and, you know, of course have, you know, tons of broad work to do every day uh, to keep people, you know, with the right equipment. But I would love to go back to, you know, go back and, and fish on tour. Of course, you start all over again. You got to climb the food chain to get back there. You know, there's no such thing as sponsor exemptions at that level. So you, you know, you got to work your way back. So unfortunately, time wise, it doesn't work out very well living on this coast. And that's why you see so many of the pros move, you know, away from California and Arizona, et cetera, Oregon to live back there because it's just such a great distance. And I understand why they don't want to bring tour events back mm -hmm. out West because of the, the cost. And um, so it would, it would require a great deal of time and, and money. And I still do fish some tournaments. I'll fish uh, a tournament, the oldest tournament on clear Lake. I fish that every year. I've been fishing, I think three years with Julie and she absolutely loves it. And she learns that tournament bass fishing is, can be fun, but for the most part, it's it's really putting your head down and trying to figure it out because you do want to beat everybody in every tournament. And to do that, you have to be hyper-focused. And I think as a relationship part of, of life, whether it's your parents or your children, uh, your, your, your immediate family, you, you really have to let those people experience a little bit of what you go through. The the flat tires, the getting gas, the making sure the bills are paid, the, you know, getting there and then your room's not ready or, or your boat breaks down. There's just so much that goes on with tournament bass fishing that I think a lot of people don't really see because the anglers keep that in their own sphere, in their own world. So it's almost like leaving, living a separate life. But I think it, it helps if you let people in and, and see all of the stuff the, the some of the people that do the very best on tour have a truck camper and a boat and their wife and their kids like uh, uh, David Dudley and, and Steve Kennedy. And uh, those, those guys traveled with their families forever. I mean, I watched from no kids to, you know, a whole gaggle of kids from particular families and, but they, they had harmony wherever they went because they all lived together and they, you know, experienced all the things that, you know, tournament high level tournament bass anglers go through every single day, 24 seven. And there's, there's no stopping. Something that I admire about you, Fred, is you seem to go out of your way to develop relationships with a lot of different people. Like you take interest in, in people that, that you find interesting too. And I think that's how you become, kind of so connected and well known like i can't tell you how many times i've 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 uh met you know met someone for the first time or something we try to figure out in the industry it's not six degrees of separation it's like one degree always and you're like the thread that connects it like oh you know fred yeah i know fred you know fred too guy's crazy oh yeah no awesome yeah fred great dude but yeah. is that something that is kind of like a philosophy for you as far like I always see you talking. We are always talking with people. You're always asking questions. You're always making introductions. You're always trying to learn. Yeah. And I think that connection is is strong. Uh, I've always been a social person, but I won't go out of my way to meet. You know, there's anglers on tour that I would love to know because I think they're real fascinating people, but I never force the issue. Uh, there are 
there are people that I've been around that I've really never spent any time with other than maybe in an event or something like that and never got to know and wish I had, uh, had done that, but I don't force it. It has to come organically. So when I meet, you know, someone like Mark Zona, I mean, what a cool person he is or Greg Hackney or, you know, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of really good people in fishing that are, um, well-versed outside of fishing as well, but they're, uh, you know, they have to come organically. So I've met people through you, of course, I met one of the, you know, my favorite people of all time, which you worked for, for a long time, the red vested one, uh, Mark Jeffries, uh, that was, you know, he's, you know, again, outside of fishing, he's like a super powerhouse, uh, real fun. Mm -hmm. How did you get into the fish and chips deal? Was it just because of that relationship that we had just from covering the tour and known and you like poker and that type of stuff and we had it so you got in you had the invitational uh i think the first one was at norman oklahoma at, at downstream or river yeah Way. it was downstream uh fish and poker combination tournament mark jeffries put it on it was like twenty five thousand for the winner of the fishing tournament twenty five thousand for poker fifteen hundred dollar entry fee and uh invitation only deal we did it for like five years there's yeah. a rundown so this was the first one like zona crete fished it uh ski reese fished it with mark jeffries rojas you uh mcclellan uh a, a ton of guys i'm leaving them all out there but it was like uh rick clun yeah I think, yeah rick clun's fished it uh Jeffries had to uh, D. I think Jeffries had to DQ. Was it Guy Eaker one year for using a net? Because we'd had a no net rule. But everyone's fish. It's something that needs to come back. But yeah. So uh, Mark had invited me probably through you. It, it's hard to say, but I think he really invited people that uh, were just outside of fishing had all kinds of things going on. I, it, it just, it seemed like that was sort of the mix and Zona was there as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of it. Some of the old greats were there, but, uh, definitely, uh, fun where we're, like you said, you laid it out. You always have the numbers. That's the amazing thing. And one of the things I like about you, you always, you're like a statistician, you know, so much about all of the people and the numbers and the times and the dates and you're pretty handy on that computer now so you can you can look everything up at a moment's notice but yeah. uh, that was incredible fun uh we played poker uh i've always been a gambler and i think that goes along with horses and fishing and tournament fishing and and things like that and uh uh definitely have a long history in my family of uh gambling so uh that fit perfectly for me and i think that first day or that first year we had like some incredible amount of hours of tournament poker play like 22 hours first year it was it was a seven is i think it was 17 hours to get down to the final table so they did a main event where professional poker players could come and buy in and a lot of them did yeah, and did. fish with the anglers so the anglers had a separate point system when you got knocked out you know you tried to make it the further you made it you got points but it was combined in the main event right so Correct. there was there was 600 people and the casino made money because it was like a 500 dollars entry fee our entry fee into it was included in the bass tournament but it was a 20 was it 25 or thirty thousand dollar payout at the end yeah, something. Yeah, it was. It, <laughs> and I never played a real game before. And you weren't ex like an exceptionally, you weren't first. like a, a poker guru. No, not at all. Not at all. And and Clark Ream was there too. I think I have some pictures of this on my Facebook. Anyway, we're 17 hours later. And I mean, I'm 23, 24, 25, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm working for Mark Jeffries, not making anything, living in an apartment by myself. Which I stayed at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's like 10 people left. Like 10 people left. And I look over and it's it's, it's Clark Ream and it's you and it's me and it's seven professional poker players. It and was, it's like three in the morning. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. I, uh, I felt 
you know, of course, with with gambling, it's all about catching cards and how well you mm-hmm. can uh, keep a poker face and keep going. And uh, and I definitely was green for sure, but I, I I made it all the way to the end. And then I think the next year or two later, then uh, I got the fish and chips uh, poker trophy somewhere here in the house. I don't I'm know. Jealous of that. I'm jealous yeah, of that. So I was going to bust it out this morning after you said I don't have that trophy but <laughs> oh shoot that uh, was, that was uh, good. we're going to take one more segment wrap things up when we come back but before i before we take a break i just want i just want to sear this image into this took a lot like i was typing i had to do a lot of digging to get to this point it's a lot of dead ends but i just want to sear this image into everyone's brain before we go to break <laughs> That's Brett Height wearing the Emodium AD Easy Choose jersey. Yes. That, you know what? That jersey has to exist somewhere still, doesn't it? And it's got his name on it. So it's not like it was one of those, like, you know, top 10 boat jerseys. Yeah. Well, I do have another side of the office that I was debating on how to decorate it. Well, I might have to I might have to open up the checkbook, but that would be a great addition, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. I've got uh, I've, I've got a uh, not that you'd want it, but I've got uh, a few of the original jerseys that I had from that time frame as well. I might have to. Uh, you got have, an OCC jersey? I have a few of them. So like I, a like an extra like I mean I could you could even like like rent it to me, but that would be an it. awesome addition. Yeah, no, it's a uh, it was it's a pretty special moment in my life for sure. Period. Uh, how about Beehide's belt? You know, he had his uh, <laughs> business trousers on and the whole nine yards. That yeah, the that, Tiger that Woods was, belt. Let me tell you, that was an amazing year and time frame because he did something that actually, you know, you you talk about moments in bass fishing where you were like, uh huh. The chatterbait was something that. I believe Brian Hastings, there was a, a, a number of guys that came along that had the chatterbait from North and South Carolina. Um, they were Chris Baumgartner, Brett Height was from the West, Brian Hastings, Brian Thrift, Todd Otten. There was a handful of guys that had, uh, Greg Pugh maybe was one of them they had this chatterbait and I saw it at a classic one year. We we're doing a show at the classic and this guy had this waterfall scenario where he would throw up this bladed jig, which no one at the time had ever seen. And he'd reel it through this water. And I, I remember I bought one and I put it away, you know, it was just, you know, one of those novelty one-offs that you think that'll never become. Well, I went to a bunch of tournaments that year and Brett Height won two of these tournaments back to back. He won, I believe, maybe two hundred and fifty thousand dollars at one, and one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars at the other. One was in California, and one was at uh, Toho. Yep. And these guys were absolutely smashing them with this new technique, if you will. And then we went to the Potomac the same year, and the same thing happened there. Chris Baumgartner, somebody like that, won it. But that lure changed so much for uh, techniques, rods, you know, just the whole thing was totally different than, than anything else we'd ever fished with. And that thing, to this day, should be on the deck of every bass angler's boat, the, the tournament fishes for sure. Uh, amen i did a episode of the coal with dave mercer which is just a little debate show and yep. we did a nine minute video or nine minute segment where i was debating that the bladed jig was the greatest tournament bait of all time that in just incredible i i it took me a couple of years to to really figure it out and i learned if there's any place with stained water you know muddy water uh, wood, grass, current, 
you know, docks. There was just the the further I got into the bait, the more it opened up. I fished um, Toyota Texas Bass Classic at uh, Conroe, Texas, and my, I was rooming with my, Kyle Mabry from Alabama at the time, and hopefully he's where wherever he is, he's listening to this show. Um, you know, from from heaven, he uh, mm -hmm. he and I uh, I j had just got a uh, order of Phoenix chatter baits in and i said man i'm catching these things off of this these docks with this thing just reeling it like you would a spinner bait you know and it wasn't something that i had done a lot before but i realized it casts super well like a bullet and i could reel it right under the foam and those bass had come out and attack it but uh yeah everywhere we went it was a big learning curve uh and brett height won at least two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on that lure in two two tournaments that year and i was like this will never leave my boat you know 12 months of the year it will be in that locker for sure if not on the deck well wow, you mentioned kyle mabry there and uh he he was one of the good ones dude he was a really good dude passed away uh, i wanted to make sure i got the date right you know six years ago now in a in an accident he was a good dude yeah. Yeah. Oh, just amazing human being. And very nice to me. Very limited interaction with him, but just one of those guys that was super nice. Yeah. And he worked at a hospital in, uh, I, be I believe, Birmingham. And he worked with children and, and just everybody that I ever come in contact with. He was such an amazing person, but he was fun to be around. And I fished uh, and roomed with him a bunch uh, over those years. So, yeah, miss him a lot for sure. All right, we're going to take our final break of the show. When we come back, wrap things up. Uh, there's several people that are like, how do I like keep up to date with Fred Cantawi now? Like I, I do the social medias of that. We'll get into all that when we come back. It. Uh, it is BTO on a Wednesday with the man, Fred Cantawi. Also, a lot of uh, the people are liking the, the mustache. It's very Pacific yeah. Northwest of you. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I had actually hair down here. You know, I'm part Asian and and uh, Hispanic, so and with the Indian blood as well, I definitely cannot grow the beard like, uh, you know, so many, you know, like, you know, crybaby Swindle. Uh, he, he can grow. <laughs> well, you, can't, you, can't, you can't say that. <laughs> what? Are you not a Swindle fan? No, no, no. I, I think he's, I, he's awesome. He's just taking a shot out of there. No, no, no. So uh, I just, it was a nickname <laughs> that Tommy Biffle gave him. He goes, oh, okay. That's fair that we could give it with Tommy. We could do it. You remember that. when, when Santa Claus gave him that nickname, he, uh, he, he buzzed by him on camera at one of the tournaments. And then, uh, I don't know if he got DQ'd or whatever that day, but it was, it was super funny because Biffle's like, yeah, damn crybaby. You know, yeah. <laughs> and the rumor yesterday's show was, you know, we talked about like waving people down to pick you up. And there was someone, uh, it's a feedback who was claiming that Biffle, you know, because you have to stop like if someone's broken down, right? Yeah, that Biffle that, had no problem picking people, pe people picking people bro who were broke down, had no problem picking them up on the way in, but he'd only allow them to choose three fish from their live well to bring with them. <laughs> Well, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's a rumor or if that's actual fact. Oh, yeah, he there's there's some rules in bass fishing that uh, came from Biffle. That, uh, that, that they're yeah, actually, I'll pick you up, but you can only ride with three. Uh, <laughs> you pick them. Yeah, I, I remember he told me a, a story one time about gas cans and the reason you can't carry gas cans in your boat anymore. And he had a whole bunch of gas cans on on his uh, deck one day because he went somewhere who knows some crazy place like he does driving through the trees at full speed and everybody else is idling around but uh yeah that's where that came from no 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 offense that wasn't a that wasn't really a pot shot it just came out i know it's all good like i said yeah. there's a story behind everything you say that's the, that's the beauty of it you've been around you've done that all right btl on a wednesday we'll be back right after this frank and Towie on the show from california Elite Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. Vibrating jigs are a great choice for any time of year, and the Kamikaze Swim On is a perfect match for any vibrating jig. Two sizes and the unique tail design gives it a bait fish profile and a great swimming action for realism. There are 17 colors. See them all at BigBiteBaits.com. 
The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat. So you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors, including Pearl Shad, which has this bleached out white look, but it's got this pearlescent, really, really pretty. We've got Copper Shad, which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back, really, really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the matte sexy shad just a really different looking color for a crankbait so you want to give them a little different look that matte sexy shad is definitely the one to go with all these colors are available in the original little john and the md elite series pro daryl gleason here my pro guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days always plenty of juice never fail the best part about pro guide batteries it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different and really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.exonlures.com and check them out for yourself. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision-making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting beatdownoutdoors.com. The new Android series is the peak of the Denali lineup and offers the ultimate Denali experience. The Android series features 36-ton multi-directional graphite combined with interlock blank technology for added strength. Each rod is outfitted with royal titanium guides that will not fail. The blank is fitted into an easy-touch, soft-feel EVA foam grip with exposed blank reel seat. This all allows the Android to transmit every movement of your bait and even the most subtle bites. The Android series is the finest rod Denali has ever made and offers an angler the ultimate fishing experience with a limited lifetime warranty. See the full lineup of Android rods at DenaliRods.com. Combining one of the most popular hook styles with Gamakatsu's beefier Superline offering, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend delivers the strength necessary to target big fish in heavy cover. Well suited for braided line and heavier fluorocarbon, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend is built using stronger Superline wire that allows anglers to easily fish a finesse worm around heavy cover. The round bend offers a larger bite area, perfect for any worm presentation, while increasing your hookup ratios. The newly enhanced Z-Band holds your plastics on the hook longer, reducing the number of pull-offs and reducing damage to plastics. Available in 2-aught, 3-aught, 4-aught, and 5-aught, this is the most durable worm hook, designed for heavier lines that hold your bait on longer. Preparation is key to success, and that preparation starts well before you ever hit the water. You're only as strong as your connection to the fish, and your line is that critical connection. Confidence in your line every minute of every day on the water is a necessity, and failure, it's not an option. Sunline makes the fluorocarbon, nylon, and braided lines to give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. All right, welcome back. Fred Kentawi, a man of many talents, careers, passions. Thank you for jumping on BTL today and telling us some of that story. There's a bunch of stuff that I didn't even know that I learned today. A lot of stuff. The majority of the stuff that I didn't know that I just knew the just the bits and pieces of. Yeah, well, I, it's all part of a life, right? Like yeah. there's, there's more to being on the deck of a boat than... Uh, than just uh just 
tournament bass fishing, you do so many other things in life. And, uh, I, I, like I say, I'm, I'm, I've been so lucky to have been, been able to meet so many good people and, and do so many different things all over the planet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I don't even know where to go with this. This is probably, or this is random. James Lopez just randomly wants to know, could Fred tell us a story of any strange encounters he's had? <laughs> Any strange encounters he's had. I guess in all your travels and stuff, I talked a little bit with Matt Stefan. We both have had some interesting encounters, some strange encounters. You ever had any of that in all the different cut like something where you're like, that shouldn't exist, but I am looking at it and I think it exists. Gosh, I don't even know where to go with that. I've had a million strange encounters. I uh I I would have to say. Uh, I was in Canada one time, just off the cuff story. I was up uh, steelhead fishing on Vancouver Island with a couple of buddies, and and we went into town, and and I said, you know, there's one person that I wish uh, uh, was with us today, and uh, I said, Randy Swisher, which is a one of the Yamaha reps in Colorado, but he is a, a, a son of famous. Uh, fly fisherman uh, Doug uh, um, Doug Swisher was his father, and as the words were coming out of my mouth, Randy Swisher goes walking across the road to another bar, and I, you know, rolled the window down at the time. It was a long time ago, you know, crank windows, <laughs> and uh, I said uh, Swish, and you know, the rest of the weekend we were with Randy Swisher, so wow. lots of strange encounters and and things happen but yeah i've i've been in some sticky situations and lots of places that definitely were strange encounters or interesting you know happenings you know meeting up with people at odd places mm -hmm. where you'd never see think you'd see someone you ever fished around hippos i have hit I have fished around because that hippos. seemed to me out of everything that I've watched, like I feel like I could handle everything. But you watch the hippo videos, and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to get it any around or near a river that has hippos in it. I don't care what kind of fish are in there. Yeah, hippos are uh, interesting creature. We always think of them as being kind of slovenly and big, and and just kind of a gentle creature. And they're anything but that. They're incredibly aggressive. They can chase you down in a boat like you have no idea. You 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 don't stand a chance unless you can out, out horsepower. That's for sure. And that's what gets I think a lot of people in trouble with those fish is there's a lot of shoals and things on those rivers and they get locked up. And guess what? Those hippos are right on them. They were way back there and all of a sudden they're right on top of you. So that's a that's a creature that you do not want to deal with. That's for sure. If you had to tango with a bear or a hippo and you're in a boat, you're taking the bear all day and twice on Sunday, right? Yeah, the bear the bear can move fast as the hippo can, but the hippo doesn't stop. That's for sure. Yeah, and then, I've had a lot of encounters with bears. What's going on? So, uh, yeah, yeah, bears are uh, bears are a whole different creature. I've spent lots and lots of time with them. I used to come out of the woods, you know, we'd be on a river and be walking. I always had a 300 millimeter lens, you know, like mm -hmm. hanging off because I took a lot of pictures back in the day and I'd come out and they'd think I'd have my 45 and I'd have my camera up when this, you know, big grizzly came out from the brush or whatever. And they'd be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, they typically don't attack you. So uh, just don't run. You know, we'd give them the whole rundown on how to deal with grizzlies. But of course you've seen a few in your, your trips to Alaska, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd Brian's rather be more scared of the moose. I, I would, uh, the moose, I've never really had any bad encounters with a moose. Although I did see one, uh, I think on social media the other day, that was uh, something I wouldn't have wanted to been around. Yeah. They can move as well. They can yeah. really move and they're a big, big animal. All right. What do you got going? What do you have coming up? How can people stay in contact if they want to follow Fred and Towie moving forward from this? Where do you so, want, what direction? I'm not super active on social media. I do look at it. I don't post a lot because I don't like to give away fishing locations typically. 
but uh, I should do it more. I, I definitely do check, you know, Fred Kentawi Outdoors on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, Douglas Outdoors, of course, is, you know, that's my gig. That's my life uh, as far as work goes and designing rods. So always around anything Douglas that you'll see, whether it be a fly show or the Bassmaster Classic or the ICAST show, different. Uh, you be at the Classic this year? I will got okay. a booth classic and I've got some great people coming there as well. I'm going to bring out John Pearl from, from the West and he's going to be in the booth. So that'll be a lot of fun. Maybe Gary Collins, uh, Kevin from the office will be there. Uh, we've got a few people. I'm hoping that Martin Villa shows up, but, uh, we definitely Lance Owen will be there. So we'll be there in the booth, yucking it up, telling stories. So yeah, come by and see the product there. I think we have probably the best, you know, both fly and conventional rods definitely available today for sure. So we'll be there, but we'll be uh, next week. I'll be going to the uh, ISE show in Sacramento and we'll have a booth there. And then I do the Portland show sport, Portland sportsman show uh, shortly after that. And I'll have mm -hmm. uh, uh, a few guys there. JD Ritchie will be there for sure. And uh, um, Patrick Collinger, uh, hope to see Buzz Ramsey there. Just a good group of people of very high caliber anglers for sure. And Listen. then, uh, of course, the classic. Can't wait for the classic. Back to Knoxville. That'll be fun. Yeah, that's uh, you'll be there. I hope. Some oh year, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'll be yeah. there. I haven't missed one yet. Don't come around, you know, like some shows you just don't well, come okay, around. Okay, listen, the last time we were at Knoxville, we were shooting a documentary the called The 49th, right? So it was the last yep. classic that Kevin and all that and all those yep. guys were in. So I was occupied. Like I didn't have time to mill, to mill about. Yeah, you're right. And then the, the following year, I actually caught some fish. So people were like, hey you caught like six this year. Would you like to hang out in the booth? So I actually had a schedule. <laughs> so, so this year I should just be wide open. I should just be roaming around. No one wants me in the booth. I'll, I'll be, I'll stop by the Douglas booth. Good. Well, you'll be fishing all the opens this year. And uh, yep. so you have nine tournaments there. Yep. And uh, what's, what's prediction? What's your best chance? What's the one standout you're like, I cannot wait to get there for that time of year for your particular skill set. What's, what's your baby out of those nine tournaments? Oh, see, see, I, I asked this question and, and, and about 75% of the guys say, Oh, that's the one that you suck at the most is the one you look forward to. But I'm literally looking at the schedule and uh, there, there's a, there's three, three that really, that really stick out to me. Uh, but sh shockingly Watts bar in Tennessee in September, I think is going to be a real grind. And some of that finesse stuff could play, you know, 10, 11 pounds a day when they have one of those kind of derbies early fall. I typically am strong at absolutely loved the St. Lawrence river uh, and smallmouth. I spent like 14 days up there last year because I knew we'd probably be going back. And then, well, you fall in Oklahoma in the middle of June. It's, yeah. it's a hard one to pass up. So I like the schedule. I like the schedule. If there's not, if there's no, if the performance isn't there, uh, it's, it's time to, it's time to reassess my decision-making, my skill set, my life decisions, as far as what I'm doing. Like this is a, this is a big year for me, Fred. Well, you know what uh, your, your buddy, Mike Iaconelli says, never give up. And that's, he does say I, that. I think that is a, a motto to live by because you know, the bass fishing thing is uh, largely unexpected. You know, the, the places that you have the least confidence in, the worst practice, et cetera, those are the ones that can shine. But there's certain things that you can do on your way into all of these. And I know at some point in time, for the first time, I believe, there's a uh, no information rule. And off the no info, period. The, there's off limits 26 to 30 days before every event, but the no info rule is only starting the day of official practice yeah and these are all good things to know going into any tournament circuit yep. whether they be club level all the way up to the elite series you definitely have to pay attention to the rules and uh, i think a lot of people get caught you know in the crossfire by listening or you know doing you know funny things to get information but 
in reality, the homework ahead of time is what colors on that particular body of water? What are the baits that they catch them on there? You know, year in, year out for that time of year. Not We're not talking spring. We're talking what day you're going to be there, what mm -hmm. period of time. And then where are most of the tournaments won? So there's there's some homework ahead of time that that can be done. And I know with all of the forward imaging and and all of the new tackle and techniques every year, those are those are going to change day by day. But there are some things, colors, locations, um, particular baits that always catch them on those particular bodies every year. Yep. So. Dude, you're so busy between the calls and that. Like now it's so it's it's eight o'clock in California. So in six, like that, everything just starts for you, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it starts a couple hours ago, but um, uh, yeah. uh, that was a fly shop in Montana. And I've been trying to get a hold of him, but uh, he's calling me back now. And it's just it's 10 o'clock for him. But okay. uh, yeah. yeah, that's good stuff. That's good advice for it. Yeah, I think just, you know, there's so many things, you know, just your tackle preparation. And I learned from Wesley Strader early on when I went fishing back east. He'd open up a crankbait box and it would be, you know, 200 crankbaits thrown into this box with no hooks on them. And I was like, that is brilliant. I can have every single color of crankbait, every model from a bomber long A to who knows what in shad patterns in this box with no hooks like there's never a lake that i'll show up on where i don't have that particular that one bait that catches them on that body of water and then i just put treble hooks on you know before the tournament to go. you know just a couple of baits and then throw the box back in the boat so yeah i think tackle prep is such a huge thing i have to I'll have to have you back on to actually show some of your boxes and do some tackle prep. Will you do that later in the year? Oh, back absolutely. on with that. We'll I, do that. Tackle box Tuesday. Yeah, no, you're, a, you're Tuesday. a nerd when it comes to that and everything you bring. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you get back to work. Before I do, though, before I side it out, I challenge anyone who's who uh, sees or listens to this podcast. You find me a man in the, the fishing industry or fisherman who is more interesting than Fred Kentowie. Hmm. There's lots challenge. of those. <laughs> I think it'd be high. I think you're selling yourself short though. I greatly appreciate it. Hour and a, almost an hour and 40 minutes with you, Fred. Uh, yeah, like I said, so Douglas much. rods, everything you've done kind of going back and we didn't even scratch the surface on a number of different things. But. Yeah. We'll talk more about Douglas cause I'm really passionate about that. And I really feel like it's a, a big aid, aid to the angler. I mean, it's one of the biggest tools in the whole tournament bass fisherman's uh, arsenal is, is their rod choices for sure. It's good stuff. See, stop by. See you at the classic. See you at the classic. Bye, a beer. Thanks for having me. All right. See you, Fred. Bye, bye. All right. That was Fred from Howie, and uh, I wasn't sure how that was going to go. Like I said, it was it was kind of difficult to throw that together because usually you got the guys on, and it's like, hey, we're going to talk about this, this, and this. But Fred's a spider web. He's not linear. It kind of goes all over all over the board, which is awesome. Which is what makes him, uh, which is what makes him such a, a dynamic dude and a good friend. Like I said, I don't get to see Fred very much, probably uh, once or twice a year, at the most. But we stay in contact via the phone for over a decade. So, all right, tomorrow the return of Frank Scalish. Day four with Frank Scalish on Thursday, and then we've made it through a week. This has been BTL. We'll see everyone tomorrow.